but they're not a reward that was better than expected, okay? So no excess dopamine. Let's say you put in another dollar, and this time you get no Funyuns. The brain actually releases less dopamine, although if you don't get your Funyuns, that's going to cause its own set of problems because, you know, you're going to want your Funyuns. <laughs> And so it's in this way that dopamine acts as a learning signal. It tells the brain when it has come across something that's particularly good for survival to pay attention to it and to prioritize it. What all of these drugs do, uppers, downers, strong, weak, legal, illegal, is they have the ability to release inappropriately large surges of dopamine in the brain. Okay? This is a system that was meant for nice and even surges, normal pleasures. But what drugs do is they create these huge surges of dopamine. And so every time a person smokes crack cocaine, for instance, and they get that surge of dopamine, they get a message from their brain that, hold the phone, ma'am, this is better than we had ever expected, even though the drug is not better than expected. This is particularly good for survival, even though the drug is quite harmful. This is better than other things in the past for survival, even though the drug isn't. This should be put higher on the priority list even though the drug shouldn't have that value. And with each time the person smokes crack cocaine and gets that surge of dopamine, the drug just climbs the list until finally it's in the number one spot. And what seems to, and this is Nora Volko's um, rate hypothesis, what seems to predict the addictive potential of the drug is the slope value of this curve. Dopamine is not a disease of too much dopamine. Excuse me, uh, addiction is not a disease of too much dopamine. We've already got that disease. It's called schizophrenia. Addiction is not a disease of too little dopamine. We've already got that disease. It's called Parkinson's disease. What addiction is, is the rate of rise. It's how fast the dopamine comes in, how fast that person can change their mood. That's what predicts the addictive potential of a drug. And probably the highest slope value I can think of is smoked cocaine and methamphetamine because of the way they're used and because of the pharmacology that's in them. Okay? So this is the dopamine hypothesis. And basically, this immediately, a whole bunch of implications become clear. This is why if a person has a defect in one, they've got a liability for the other. And we see this clinically. I'm sure you do too. People will come to treatment, and they fully admit they're cocaine addicts. And they say, i got to stop the cocaine. I'm going to stop the cocaine. And then they make the mistake of saying, but I never had a problem with alcohol. So, you know, I don't see the point in stopping the alcohol. I'll stop the cocaine, but not the alcohol. And so they leave treatment in good faith. They stop the cocaine. They continue to drink. They start to binge drink. And they can't figure out why they keep relapsing back to cocaine. Now we know why that is. Very often alcoholics come to me and they say, Doc, I'm a terrible alcoholic. You've got to get me off the alcohol. And I drink. I, I drive. I get into fights. I hit my wife. I don't want to do these things, Doc. I say, Doc, is there any way you could get me off the alcohol by maybe putting me on a marijuana maintenance program? <laughs> Because when I smoke pot, I, I don't get into fights. I eat a box of cookies and I go to bed. <laughs> well, you know, it makes sense, but you see the problem is that they've just moved over, okay? And they'll make it a little while. I've seen folks make it quite a while. But when stress really kicks in, so does the midbrain. It's not that the midbrain isn't appreciative. It is. It says, thank you for the pot. I appreciate the pot. <laughs> Doing a fine job with the pot. But I got to tell you, we're under a lot of stress these days, and you're, you're, you're not quite where you were when you were drinking a fifth of Jack Daniels every day. So thank you for the pot. Get me what I want, and we'll be led back to the drug of choice through the other dopamine release. Okay? This also puts new light on the craving that these folks experience if they're continuing to chain smoke and drink huge amounts of caffeinated pot. Okay? You see what they're doing? They're poking the same part of the brain. And I'm not saying that it's going to cause a relapse, but it puts them at risk for it. And so I think nicotine cessation comes you know, a little further into the clinical mind at this point. What's powerful about this hypothesis is that it shows us that not just drugs cause these surges of dopamine, but there are behaviors too. And there are people on this side of the list who can manipulate these behaviors so carefully that they can get the same kinds of dopamine surges that these people do. And so once we understood that the, the connection was dopamine, we saw the full extent of the problem. And this explains why we see so much cross-addiction and why if a person doesn't handle this and that and that, then they're likely to just keep bouncing back and forth. Okay, I've got about 15 more minutes. We started a little late, okay, so I'll keep it going. If there's a problem here, the next system to become involved is the memory system, okay? The second chemical in this cascade is called glutamate, right? 
glutamate is the chemical of memory formation. What ha normally happens is you see a, a normal release of dopamine and then a normal release of glutamate. And glutamate helps remember the dopamine surge. But because these dopamine surges are silvery, you get a concomitant surge of glutamate. And what that does is it locks the drug into memory. And everything that goes along with the drug, the time of day, people that the person was with, sights and smells of the time, they are locked into that drug memory with it. And if a person is exposed to those sensory triggers, even after many years, that will cause a surge of glutamate. And then the other thing that glutamate does is it is the chemical of drug seeking. And so this is why you can see relapses even after long periods of abstinence. All of this is going on deep in the brain uh, uh, before the addict is even aware of it. And so what you've got are dopamine nerves going up and glutamate nerves coming back down. Dopamine says, hey, this is important. Glutamate says, okay, I'll remember. Dopamine <laughs> says, I really want this. Glutamate says, fine, go and get it. And with each time the person uses and gets these surges, those neural pathways become stronger and stronger and stronger. And the only way to get them to fade is to stop uh, the surges altogether. And this is why I think abstinence will always be a faster way to get the person out of this unconscious um, reflex. Okay, the next system that comes involved is the stress system. When I say that stress is a cause of addiction, a lot of people roll their eyes and they say, oh, come on, you know, we all crave stress. We don't all smoke crack. Good point. Prosecutor makes that point all the time, okay? Um, here's the thing. The stresses that we're talking about are severe stresses. They're early stresses. They're stresses where the person has no coping mechanism. It turns out that women who are battered in pregnancy can give birth to children who have a higher likely of ADHD, anger management problems, and stimulant addiction. In many ways, their brains are sensitized to stress, okay? So even the stresses that the mother was under and levels of circulating stress hormones in her bloodstream can play a big part in the way her baby's brain comes together. So that when her baby is born, its, ba its brain is a little sensitive and more vulnerable to addiction, okay? And what happens is when these stressors get, uh, don't, aren't dealt with and they persist, they cause these high levels of CRF, that causes a downregulation in dopamine receptors. In other words, when a person does something pleasurable, their cells release dopamine, but the cells that would ordinarily pick it up can't because they have no receptor. In a sense, they are dopamine deaf. A psychiatrist or psychologist would call this anhedonic. It is basically pleasure deafness. Under severe stress that persists over time and is not dealt with, the brain becomes less able to derive normal pleasure from normally pleasurable things. These are people that you take to Disneyland, and everyone else is having a great time, and they're going, I don't get it. <laughs> you know, mouse, who cares? Toad ride, not interested, right? They are pleasure deaf. So what can they hear? Anything that can pour out the dopamine, anything that basically shouts. And so when they get that surge of dopamine, the brain locks onto that, says that's it, that relieved that stress, and that's when the drug goes right to the top of the list. And so now, anytime you have rising levels of stress, the brain, it's an old slide, sorry about that. Every time you have rising levels of stress, the brain goes straight to the thing that it knows is best at relieving that stress, the drug. And so, for instance, if mom dies, God forbid, what's the answer? The drug. If the person gets a parking ticket, what's the answer? The drug. As we say in AA, if we let ourselves get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, what's the answer? The drug. And this connection is below the level of consciousness. Cunning, baffling, there are three things that have been known to cause relapse. One is a dopamine surge from the, a brief re-exposure to the drug itself, but keep in mind there are other things that can cause dopamine releases, okay? Exposure to drug fears, very powerful relapse trigger, and then unmanaged stress. What you'll sometimes see in treatment is patients inadvertently combine all three things together, okay? And we'll see this on the smoking patio. People are sitting around talking about drugs, that's a cue, while they're smoking, that's dopamine release and being in treatment is already stressful. The last system to go in this list is now we are finally in the frontal cortex and it is the system that we need to make choices, okay? The midbrain has a very cruel tool at its disposal to protect the connection of the drug to survival. That tool is called craving. Now this is a hard concept for the non-addict to understand. 